Welcome to Horror 101, a special series celebrating some of the most influential films from the horror genre. We begin with John Kenneth Muir, an accomplished author and critic, and one of our favorite guests. You can check out his library of books on films of all genres at johnkennethmuir.com and read his enlightening criticism at reflectionsonfilmandtelevision.blogspot.com. Okay, I got you. This is my home. This I am leaving the comfort house for the weekend to explore the Blair Witch. You've heard of the Blair Witch several times. I was laying down on the leaves, pile of leaves, kind of watching my pool and looking up at the sky. Have you ever heard of the Blair Witch? And uh, all of a sudden, I felt like something was near me, right? You know, kind of a eerie feeling. What's your take on the Blair Witch at this point? Do you think she exists? I don't know. I gave you back the map, Heather. I gave you the map. I gave you back the map. I don't. lost. Admit that first. Because we're n uh, no, I know we're not lost. Hello? Hello? They're <laughs> all over the place. Holy shit. Oh my god, what a fucking And it's all because of me that we're here now. Hungry. And cold. And hunted. Blair Witch was a, a phenomenon upon its release, uh, obviously, and, and it really was one of the first, if not the first, example of the the independent kind of uh, digital revolution and, and how it can be applied to the horror genre. And I find that we've been talking about films and the immediacy, the, the, that feeling that you get from the most successful ones. I find that that's, that's the main characteristic of the successful ones that are shot uh, digitally, I, I agree with you, and you know I think um, you know there's been so much backlash against the Blair Witch, and because it was made sort of by people starting out in the industry, and because um, you, you know the way it was created, where it, there's, they were sort of led around the actors and, and kind of improvised, you know, moment to moment where they were and their reactions were improvised. That it, p people look at that and they're very tempted to say. Well, this isn't a movie, you know. This is, you know, somehow it's not like a real movie because, you know, it was it wasn't all planned to the last detail, and you know, it was made cheap and and all that. You know, th th there's so many people put down the Blair Witch Project all the time, um, which I don't think is fair. I I think that um, I, I always go back to a quote I got from one of my heroes and mentors, um, uh, Johnny Byrne, who passed away in 2008. He was the story editor for Space 1999, and he wrote the famous uh, rock and roll, um, uh, co-wrote the famous rock and roll book Groupie in the late 1960s about the London um, rock scene in the late 60s and early 70s. And we, we became good friends through our mutual sort of association with Space 1999. And he, I remember we, we had a, a phone call, uh, international phone call after we had met and we talked about films. I said, oh, have you seen The Blair Witch Project? And he said, yes. And and he really loved it. And he said to me, he said, you know, the trick of that movie, John, he said, is that they turned all of their their weaknesses into strengths. He said they had nothing, and they turned that into a strength. And I've never mm. forgotten that, because I think that really gets at, at how successful and how good the film is. I mean, is it a messy and chaotic film in a way? Yes. But it's messy and chaotic in a way that sort of furthers the movie's theme, this idea of, you know, chasing your tail all alone when the technology you think will help you won't help you. You know, out in the woods, the camera, it, it can record all your terror, but it, it can't call the police. You know what I mean? It, mm -hmm. it, it, can't, it can't show you the way out of the woods. And, you know, the core idea of this movie is, is that, you know, these three kids are either bedeviled by, you know, a really evil witch or by their own inability, even with the latest tools of our culture, to distinguish between reality and fantasy. Uh, and I love that. I love it. And, you know, talking about how powerful 
uh, ambiguity is in film. I mean, the film's presentation, it, it's messy and, cha and chaotic, but abundantly ambiguous. I mean, um, you know, it, it's the idea that multiple interpretations of reality are possible. You know, and, and, and the movie's very structure, I think, mirrors that, because sometimes you're watching videotape, sometimes you're watching film stock, Sometimes you're watching the events as they're captured unfolding to the characters and some staged bits of a student's documentary project. Sometimes sound is recorded, sometimes it's not. So, you know, you ask yourself, well, what is the point? Why structure the film in this way? And I, I think, again, the point is that it's very much a commentary on where we were at the, uh, you know, at the turn of the millennium, I guess, back in 1999. And it comes back to that question, you know, is Bill Clinton a great president or was he a cheating big creep? You know, which is it? You know? <laughs> By the end of the 1990s, we had 24-hour news cable stations. Uh, we had a uh, nascent blogosphere and you know widespread Internet use. And we were no closer to understanding that simple truth about the man who led this country uh, than we would have been without those things. In fact, it just seemed to muddy the waters. Um, mm. you, know, we, the, you know, abundant hours were spent you know, on the Internet, on CNN, on Fox, on M MSNBC – you know, should he be impeached? Should he not be impeached? Was it was it perjury or was it a private matter? All, all these things, and so the idea I think of the Blair Witch Project is simply, you know, technology is not helping. Um, we because we have all of these things to help us discern what is the truth, um, and and we can't even agree on facts anymore. Isn't that crazy? The more information we have, the less we agree. You know, mm -hmm. is evolution a myth? Is global warming a hoax? We have more. His science at our disposal now than at any point in the history of the human race, and we can't agree on simple facts. And I think in some ways that's what the Blair Witch is really about. It's this unresolved anxiety of the technological age. Um, and, 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 and to me, that puts it up into the realm of a film like The Birds or 2001 A Space Odyssey, where sort of the riddle of what's really going on is left for the viewer to sort out and fill out for you know him or herself. And in, in this case... I think the resourceful viewer, you know, has to grab, you know, the the dangling threads, you know, of the film's ambiguous narrative, and and, and try to tie everything together in in a way that offers some kind of order, um, you know. And I I just think that the Blair Witch Project is is brilliant because of that, and you know, I I think it's about the way that we think technology protects us and gives us a barrier or a force field from danger, and we. we you know, we we think well. We have the camera, and and if I look through the camera, I'm safe. And at one point, it says something like that. And I, I guess it's Josh who says, I, "I see why you like this. It's not quite reality." You know, something along those lines. He says, "You know, that's all I have left." You know, it's better to believe in the safe illusion than in the uncomfortable truth. And to me, that's you know just very clearly what the Blair Witch Project uh, is about. Um, and, and I mean, it's possible to interpret that film in a lot of different ways. A lot of different ways. I mean, there could be an, an unknown actor in that film, uh, you know, a, a figure who's who's chasing the, you know, who, who, who's trailing the these three filmmakers, who's never introduced, never seen, who's not supernatural. They might just be stalked by a madman. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you could you could say that. I mean, because what about you know, turning your face in the corner at the end? You know, what what's going on? You know, they're, they're just all these. It could be a witch. It could be supernatural. It could not be supernatural. You know, they say they're lost and going over the same territory. Well, is it because they're incompetent and arrogant, or is it because they're being cursed and acted upon by right. the supernatural? And I think the film is great for the way it walks that line. And I, I think if they had rigorously stuck to some sort of, um, uh, you know, preordained script, the movie wouldn't have those qual qualities. There are some real wonderful sort of side alleys and dead ends in the Blair Witch Project that make the film messy and chaotic, but also open up all these realms of possibilities. The, uh, the accidents make it magical. Yeah, I, I, yes, I agree. Yeah, the accidents make it magical. Exactly. That's it. Exactly. There, you know, there, there's just something so powerful about that film. This is when you know a horror movie really gets it. Horror movies, to me, work at their best when they're about a universal human fear. And so, so, so going into the water and getting attacked by a shark, Jaws, okay, universal human fear. Going into the shower and being vulnerable, there's only a little bit of, there's only a curtain between you and the real world and you're, and you're naked, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, or, or you go to sleep and, and, and your, your soul is taken, an invasion of body snatchers. We all have to sleep. These are all universal experiences. Getting lost in the woods is another one of those universal experiences. And I love sort of the resonance of Hansel and Gretel in, um, the Blair Witch Project. I mean, not only is there an evil witch out there, maybe, 
um, but the, the, the three kids are, you know, are lost in the woods. And, and I think the idea there is not that they have been cast out and, and made lost in the world by specific bad parentage, but they've been done so by a culture that has sort of let them go and let them be raised um, by the pop culture so that they, they don't have any real experience. They're, they're out in the woods doing this dangerous thing, and they're talking about Gilligan's Island. They're talking about making movies. You know, they're, mm. they're, they're, there are these references and that suggest, you know, these were the latchkid latchkey kids of the 1980s, uh, raised and babysat by the television in the late 1980s, who are now in college. And that's all they can talk about, is, is movies and televisions and Generation X touchstones. And it, it's sort of like, you know, they're Hansel and Gretel lost in the woods, and, 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 and the woods in this case aren't just the literal woods. They're, they're, the, they're, they're the woods of this huge pop culture, 24-hour landscape, which provides us more alternatives more imagery than we've ever had in the history of the world and no way to really interpret them and no way to understand truth. And there's you're not separated by the artifice of a of a of a polished film. I mean the, right. what strikes me also about Blur Witch is that um there were people that a large number of people that actually went to the theater and they were Conditioned to think that this was this was real. They they wanted right. to see a real experience. There there was no right. separation. There was no like suspension of disbelief involved with a lot of these people. Right. I mean they they bought it hook line and sinker when they went to see it, and there was that palpable sense when I saw it in the theater the opening weekend uh, that that that's what we were watching. I mean I I knew right. that wasn't real, but right. <laughs> because I knew how it was done. But that, that gave it a very special uh, a very special quality. Uh, and so I think the bad rap that it gets now is is partly due to the cynicism that people see. Oh, it was it was a marketing ploy. I mean, it was it, it it was it was this plan that they had all along to 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 trick us and to fool us. But that's what you want for movies. I mean, it was it, well, it that's was that's the story of all movies. That's that's the joke yes. about this. That all Everything, all movies yeah. are marketing ploys, and all, and all movies want to fool you into making you think they're real. Just the Blair Witch was exceptionally good at playing that game. So, you know, yes, it was a brilliant marketing strategy, but it also happened to be sort of a, a brilliantly made horror movie. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I, I I think what you see in that response, and I think you're 100% correct, is that people were longing for the purity and simplicity of something that they could say was real and had really happened. And, and, and you know, you'd say, well, why do people want that? Why do people want that in 1999? Well, we were, we were in the middle of the impeachment saga, you know. He, shed, he said, she said, you know, you couldn't keep track of it all. Who, you know, who did what? And we'd had, we'd had a whole decade of these morally relative films, um, uh, like Cape Fear uh, and, and stuff. And not only were they morally relative, but also the recent horror trend was self-reflexive. The movies weren't just about the story. Movies like Scream, I Know What You Did Last Summer, Urban Legend, all from the late 90s, these were all movies about themselves. They were yes. about horror tradition. They weren't just about the characters in the play. They were asking you to countenance a whole canonical history of horror films and understand where these entries fit in that canonical history and, and, and what those references meant, this, this postmodern self-reflection. And that's very interesting, I, I think, that, that, that period of, of, of self-reflection in horror cinema. And I owe it in a large part due to the fact that we had no international enemies. You know, in, in, in the 90s, things got to be so good as far as how the country was doing by the latter half of the decade, that it was almost like, well, horror movies have no choice now but to turn upon themselves and look at themselves we're mm. not going to look outwards. We're going to look at themselves. We're going to look at ourselves and where we've been in our history there. And and look, we did this. And you know, look at Scream with the jokes about you know all the horror movies we grew up on. It's like they they turned inward because the context outward was mostly good. I, I always say bad times make great horror movies. Good times make lousy horror movies. <laughs> not that all these horror movies were lousy. They were interesting. Some of them were very interesting. But, but but they required you go in and do this intellectual dance. Okay, I'm watching characters in a movie discussing characters in other movies, and they know they're in a horror movie, but they also know the threat is real. And that, that's sort of a delicate dance you have to do. I, I happen mm -hmm. to like it. I don't have any problem with it. But The Blair Witch offered something very different. It's purity and simplicity, apparently. This is real. This yeah. is found footage. It really happened. You go in there, and I think people so wanted that. It, it was the freedom from that 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 sort of 
postmodern self-reflection. Of course, the joke of it is, is that Blair Witch Project, in a way, is more self-reflective and postmodern <laughs> than uh, than all those movies because it's claiming to be a uh, you know pure, a real thing, and actually the opposite is true. And in fact, it's it's all about how we see. How we see and recognize things, what our assumptions are about things, how how media changes the way we experience things. It's about mm-hmm. all those ideas. You know, in in a way, it's almost the summation of the whole self-reflective experience. But people going in didn't know that that that's what's going to be. And I, and I think the backlash is because people wanted something so pure. That this is real. Oh my gosh, can you believe this really happened? It's it's like you know, I mean, people watch YouTube. You know, and no nobody has really uploaded. A, a, you know a UFO or a real troll being seen. You, you know what I mean? It's like, God, I wish. Yeah. You know, more people are videotaping now than ever in history, but, you know, w- w- there, there's no there's no real UFO sighting and there's no real uh, conclusive sighting of a troll or the Loch Ness Monster or Sasquatch as much as we want it to be. There's just not. And, and so the, the reaction to the Blair Witch was like, oh, you know, I really thought I was going to see a UFO for the first time. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I really thought I was going to see the real Loch Ness Monster. You know, but you're not because because it's it's not out there. It's not available. <laughs> yes. You know? I'm not saying UFOs aren't real, but I'm saying that it's like you're longing to see God or something. You think you're going to see God, but you know you can't really see God. You know what I mean? You can't mm-hmm. really go and say, "There's God." You know, you see, you think, I'm going to go. See. There was really a witch at work there. Well, then everybody's so upset. Well, we never saw the monster in the blur. We never even saw the witch. Well, that's kind of the point. That's our world. You can't go to YouTube and see, you know, the witch levitating people. You can't see, you know, Bigfoot except on a $6 million man. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you, you, you know, it's a, it, it, I think a lot of people had a very childish reaction. They, they, they believed they were going to see something that can't be seen and, yeah. and sort of punish the movie because they expected to see the impossible. When in fact the movie was about how we see and and, and and what we think we see and what we want to see and uh, and, and the different ways that media can influence us uh, in, into believing those things. So I'm, I'm sure you've written at length about the Blair Witch for your 1990s book. Yes, I have. You know, th- th- there's a lot of backlash against it. There's a, there's a lot of people who want to punish the movie for being successful, who want to punish it for because it was made cheaply and made so much money. Um, but, you know, it, it did what all movies do. It, it attempted to mark itself brilliantly. It just happened to succeed beyond wildest expectations. And it, it's a terrifying movie. You know, there, there are some select movies I will not watch alone in the house because I am a coward. <laughs> I, will not watch, I will not watch The Exorcist alone when I'm alone in the house. I will not. Yeah. I, I will not watch Halloween, John Carpenter's Halloween, alone in the house. And I won't watch The Blair Witch Project when I'm alone in the house. You know, th- th- those movies resonate with some sort of, you know, deeply disturbing, you know, dark possibilities that they hint at larger, very upsetting orders and worlds that, you know, I don't know. They- they're just very successful at what they do, I think. And I, I-, I think it, uh, you know, we've been talking about game changers. I think it was a game changer. And I, I think its influence is still obviously seen in a lot of films today. I mean, it raised the stakes. Um, you know, and, and we see it with an enormous success like Paranormal Activity, a film that's not as successful like Diary of the Dead. And and, and there's Wreck and there's Cloverfield, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, all these movies ape um, the Blair Witch Project. And, 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 you know, I love it. Some critics of the Blair Witch Project will say, well, there was a film in 1998 called The Last Broadcast about people who got lost and murdered in the woods, and then there was a myth about the Jersey Devil. Well, have you seen The Last Broadcast? It, it, it's it's a it's a decent low budget film, but but that's not the focus. It, you know, it, it has a completely different focus than uh, the Blair Witch Project. It has a different motive, a different point, uh, you know, and a very different narrative. And 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 it didn't do as successfully what Blair Witch perfected a year later. So you know, it's 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 always interesting when people, you know, so many people try to take credit away from the Blair Witch Project. They say, well, you know, and and that's one way to do it. Well, they just imitated a film that came out a year earlier, which was the last broadcast. But really. Mm. Last Broadcast is not the immersive experience that the Blair Witch Project is, and, and Last Broadcast doesn't really intrinsically deal with the kind of things that Blair Witch Project does. It's interesting, and it's you know I, I review that in my book too, but it, but it's certainly no Blair Witch. Um, you know, people will do anything to sort of delegitimize the Blair Witch Project, and I'm not sure why, but I mean I've, I've heard that Heather Donahue, it's like she was she was run off the road by an angry Blair Witch 
uh, hate her, you know, stuff like she had to go into hiding. You know, I don't get that. I don't no, I don't either. That. Yeah, I, I really don't. That's that's probably why I, I, she's so uh, hesitant about talking about Blair Witch, because uh, I, I can't get her. <laughs> I, uh, I, I've gotten everyone else associated with the film, but I I, I can't get to her. But um, I, I, and I think she gives a performance. Oh, as she's important. Fantastic and powerful, in that movie. You know, as Heather Langenkamp in Nightmare on Elm Street or, or Jamie Lee Curtis in Halloween. I mean, it's just as important to the genre and the development of the genre as those performances. It's an amazing performance. She creates a real, believable person, you know, with, with, without the crutch of the words to tell her to do it in some sense. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's, uh, she, I think she's amazing in the film. I, I find her a fascinating person to watch. I really do. I, I really yeah. do. I think she's amazing in the movie. <laughs> I'm scared to close my eyes. I'm scared to open them. The Blair Witch Project went on to become the highest grossing film in relation to cost in the history of cinema. Writers, directors Eduardo Sanchez and Daniel Myrick created a timeless horror film that shocked shook and frightened audiences worldwide and continues to do so to this day. Aided by unforgettable performances from stars Heather Donahue, Michael Williams, and Joshua Leonard, the film became a major part of the popular vernacular, forever expanding the possibilities of the independent film and revolutionizing the way these films are marketed. Daniel Myrick, Eduardo Sanchez, and Michael Williams. Gentlemen. Hey, it's great to have you guys on. Thank you. I'm uh, waiting for uh, Mr. Sanchez to call in, uh, but it, it's it's great to have you both here. Um, Good to be here. I, I wanted to start out uh, w- with you, Daniel. Uh, you guys are kind of local legend around where I live in the Central Florida area. Uh, you both attended the University of Central Florida, is that correct? That's correct. Yep. It, is that where you both first met? Yeah, we met in uh, film school. We were part of the inaugural film class at UCF, and Ed and I met uh, there, and and uh, soon, you know, kind of got to know each other and and liked each other's work, and and found ourselves kind of collaborating on stuff pretty early on. Yeah, what, what kind of uh, what drew you to each other? What kind of commonalities attracted you both? Well, you know. Um, I, I just, you know, saw this guy's kind of wacky work on the screen, and I thought he was really talented, and and he seemed to have a really good sense of humor, which is a big plus for me. And yeah. and um, as we kind of got to know each other, you know, we realized that we had kind of the same ideas about film and and you know, um, cinema and stuff like that. And and uh, I liked Ed because he didn't take himself too seriously, and right. and uh, so he was really down to earth and easy to work with, and. And it, you, you know, aside from all that, it was just kind of fun to hang out with. So it was real easy, easy collaboration for me. Yeah, take me back to the beginning. How did how did the idea for Blair Witch start? Well, it was uh, you know probably one of those many kind of drunk nights in college. You're kind of tossing around ideas and stuff like that. And um, Ed and I, you know, we were growing a little frustrated with I think kind of the current current state of horror, you know, there was a lot of films that were coming out that were big budget things that really weren't scaring people and and uh and he and I kind of shared this love for um you know the old 70s series like In Search of and Ancient Astronauts and right, right. and there was this movie that came out uh um Legend of Boggy Creek oh yeah, uh, yeah. Bigfoot kind of limited release film and and uh and they were kind of all shot in this documentary style and and uh we always thought that was very very creepy you know whether it's seeing blurry photos of UFOs or or these kind of shaky camera of Bigfoot kind of running through the woods we just felt that kind of sense of realism was really effective on kind of work on your kind of primal horror senses and we wanted to kind of translate that into a narrative into a movie and so it just started off with that kind of aesthetic and then kind of evolved into how do we create a story that you could use that kind of idea that home video look and and one thing kind of led to another and we just kind of created this idea about these kids that were out shooting this legend it originally started out being kind of like a cult thing or whatever but it turned into this kind of you know witch legend and 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 uh, kind of evolved from there well mr sanchez just uh just called in mr sanchez are you there 
Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Thanks so much for calling in and being a part of this. No problem. Sorry I was late. It's been a oh, that's, crazy that's day. Fine. That's fine. Uh, Darn kids. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, guys? Hey, man. <laughs> uh, Michael, I wanted to ask you, Was this was your first film, correct? Uh, it was my first film. I do have to make a quick correction, though, before uh, I roll on that one, and that is, and Ed didn't hear it, but... IMDb has uh, incorrectly reported that I'm working on Seventh Moon with Ed. That is not true. Okay. Uh, Ed and I have had a serious rift, and I'm surprised I just said hello to him at all. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kidding. well, you know, I didn't know he was going to be on the interview, so I'm going to leave right now. <laughs> I got to get off. <laughs> but uh, yeah, IMDb screwed up. I'm not in it. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks for setting that up for us. So, so th- this was your first film. Uh, did did you audition for this? How, how did it come about for you? I did. It was uh, an open call in um, a newspaper called Backstage um, mm-hmm. in New York City, and uh, there is also Backstage West. It's just um, um, a newspaper that every week lists um, auditions for mostly actors looking at who do not have representation. There is some SAG work, but mostly it's non-union mm-hmm. stuff. And, you know, when you're trying to break in, that's – you know, you, all you do is, you know, you work your day job and you send your headshots out to um, all these ads in these newspapers and you send your uh, headshots out to agents. And I wasn't getting any bites with the agents and I'd go on these open calls. And it was probably only the third or fourth one I went on and it was, you know, just tons and tons of people. Mm. And they broke it down into, uh, you know, I guess two weekends, guys, right? I think they did two weekends and they just kept dwindling the amount of people down to finally it was, you know, it actually, I believe Josh and Heather, on the last Sunday, Josh and Heather had gotten their parts, and it was just me and another guy who was a, who was a really talented actor, uh, this guy Bill, and I were both auditioning for uh, for the for the role, and so I knew it was just either me or him, and then uh, a couple of days later, Ed called me, and um, I was downtown in New York with a friend, and they said, you know, are you available on these dates, and I was just thrilled. Mm, I'm ecstatic. Bet, yeah. bet. Um, Eduardo, should I call you Ed or Mr. Sanchez? Oh, yeah, call me, call me Mr. Sanchez, please. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Sanchez, uh, you, you got it. Uh, how did how did you and Daniel conceive these characters, and, and how did how did Michael and, and Joshua Leonard and Heather Donahue fit your conception of those characters, and, and what did they bring that was new to them? Well, the, the characters, I mean, we we call them like Bill, John, and uh, was it Jane or Mary or. Yeah, we, we basically we knew that we we were gonna call the characters by the actors' names, so we just made kind of these generic names, and we really didn't come up with any um, you know character traits for you know any of them really, because um, we knew we we wanted to just kind of let the actors kind of fill those ca- those uh, th- those kind of sketches for us. But but basically, what we were looking for is just three different you know people. Like uh, we knew that that Heather or you know the the the, the woman was going to be kind of the leader of the expedition, mm-hmm. and then we wanted these two other guys that were kind of different you know looking and you know uh, just kind of different characters. You know, we didn't want two people that were the same. So. Yeah, you know, once we got Josh, you know, Josh was kind of like this, uh, you know, he had long hair and he was kind of like this artistic guy. You could t- totally see him kind of being a cameraman or a director or something. And then uh, Mike kind of fit like this, kind of like a technical guy, like a the sound guy, you know. And, he, you know, we just thought that them together just made a, a, a perfect little blend. But then I really didn't think about characters at all other than than the head the you know the lead heather being you know s- strong-willed enough to lead these two guys on this you know expedition into the woods but other than that you know we kind of left it up to to the casting and that was inherent in heather's personality that that she could take over that kind of uh kind of leader role that you saw in her yeah i mean during the audition she kind of just blew us away by you know her strength and you know uh you know, she, she had a, you know, she, she, you could definitely see that she could, uh, you know, that she could be this filmmaker who was just kind of obsessed with, you know, the Blair Witch and just wanted to get whatever she could from, um, for, you know, from shooting this. And so, and, and you know, and then in the, uh, you know, out on, on low, out in, on when we were shooting it, you know, Heather just kind of developed this, this character, which I think was kind of, uh, I mean, Mike could probably attest to this better than me, but was kind of a little bit, uh, you know, uh, you know. I don't know. How would you describe it, Mike? 
<laughs> I mean, I think it was like Heather times ten, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Was like, oh my God, she's such a bitch. If I'm allowed to say that on the radio, which you I, can say whatever yeah, you, you want on the show. Okay, cool. Um, and that was just, you know, she she had a, a very aggressive personality, and I think the way she approached it was to expand on that. And what worked about it, and I think she knew it was working, was you know. She was able to lead us down a path that she was so strong-willed that she was going the right way all the time, and she was able to get us to sort of be against her, and I think that worked for the film. So it's very um, dynamic. I, mean, I don't think it was. I think it was Heather, but I think she really sort of powered it up, you know, a couple of notches. And my only thing about the character stuff was, you know, they wanted me. I remembered from the auditions and from some of the notes they gave me to sort of be the scared one who didn't want to get out of the tent, uh-huh. and so that. That was really the only difference in my character, personally. They said, we want you to be 100% yourself, but we want you to be kind of the scaredy cat of the group, you know? So so I did that times 10, and Heather might have done the aggressive bitchy thing times 10, you know? Yeah. Everybody had to enhance their personalities in some facet or another. Not all of our personalities, but some facet of our personality had to be altered for in order for this project to work. Oh, yeah. Dan- Daniel, tell me about the structure of the production and, and lo- kind of the logistics of it as you laid them out. Well, it was, it was kind of interesting because, you know, Greg Hale, our producer, had a, a, a lot to do with how we kind of laid out the logistics. And, and I know Ed and I had discussed early on that, you know, we, we want this thing to look real and, and feel authentic like it was a home video. And, and originally we were going to go out and just shoot, you know, just a few chunks that were going to be kind of part of an overall bigger kind of framework of a fake documentary. But when we went out there in, you know, and the Maryland Woods to shoot this thing, you know, Greg helped us out because he was like from earlier special forces training and stuff like that, and he kind of turned us onto these GPS units that we were able to kind of go out ahead of time and mark waypoints in the woods that we could allow the actors to kind of carry on through uh, this kind of big stage in the woods without being guided by, you know, a big cumbersome crew, and they were able to kind of stay in character for the most part. And our theory was that, you know, just instruct the actors to shoot everything and anything and not worry about, you know, going in and out of character. We're just going to capture these great improvisational moments that we can kind of piece together like a real documentary uh-huh. in the edit suite, which is where, you know, we'll, you know, do most of our direction is just get all this raw footage, you know, following this narrative through line, but direct the actors by kind of remote control where they kind of come upon one of these waypoints and they can open up these canisters with directing notes in them so we can steer these characters through this kind of, um, you know, this this stage, but uh, make our adjustments as we go. But for the most part, kind of doing this method filmmaking approach allowed the actors to kind of, um, you know, play their roles to the max and, 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 um, and not be kind of bogged down by your typical... Um, you know, shooting methodology with cameramen and, and you know, action and cut between takes and things like that. They could they could really kind of get into it. That's something that I was I was wondering about because Michael, I know you own your own or you have your own acting uh, studio, right? Uh, which I definitely want to discuss in just a moment. But you know, actors are always kind of looking for that the high of the transcendent moment, the the moment of transcendence. Right. Uh, the, the style of this production, kind of the or- unorthodox quality of it, uh, did that allow for those kind of moments for you more effortlessly? A hundred percent. I mean, go back to the audition. I mean, in the audition notice and backstage, it said, fully improvisational feature film to be shot in a wooded location. I still at that point didn't know that we would actually be out there, you know, for eight days straight. It did say once you get to the audition that, you know, you'll spend most of your time actually in the woods. And I just kept getting more and more excited. And then once I got down there, I mean, they're basically saying, you know, here's the gear. You're on your own. You're going to get notes. Go. Have fun with it and roll with it. It was literally like an eight-day-long theater exercise. And I had just come from, you know, theater training in New York for four years or five years in college. And uh, so for me to get that opportunity to just let loose, I mean, every day there were many transcendental moments that you just said, you know, you just didn't, there was no, um, there was no limit to what you could do because you knew it was video and you knew no matter how far I go, they, if they don't like it, they don't use it. And that's the end of it. And they have another, you know, 23 and a half hours from this day, 
you know. So it was just it was just an amazing, an amazing experience, and one that I'm likely never to have again, you know, as yeah. far as that stretch of time. Yeah, it, it seems like a real gift for an actor the way that the, the way Blair Witch was put together. Yeah, it was. Uh, Mr. Sanchez, <laughs> when did you know that your film worked? You know, were you anticipating this level of success, or what were your expectations? No, no. I mean, we, you know, Dan and I were just kind of. Uh, yeah, we had it all planned out. We wanted to. to uh, yeah, we had. I mean, we had the pose for the cover of Time magazine and the news we figured out. We had all that. Um, no, I mean, you know, we we hope to get, you know, that we were getting, you know, we we're going to get some kind of video distribution deal, or maybe, you know, HBO or Showtime or or something like that. You know, that's, that that was our biggest hope. You know, maybe perhaps, you know, very limited theatrical yeah, kind of art house. But I was like, you know, pie in the sky. Right. Um, Oxygen Network. You know, we we started getting like uh, an idea of what kind of, you know, of the, of the power of the movie when, you know, kind of when Dan and I would kind of. Um, because you know, I mean, we 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 directed the film, but you know, it was you know it was done by you know almost like you know it's like long distance directing, you know what I mean? So we would get the footage in, and we kind of knew it was on there, but you know, it was basically it was the first time we were seeing some of that stuff. And some of those scenes, just watching the raw footage, you know, was kind of taking us away, you know, and like just blowing us away. So we were like, man, if this is doing this to us, and we're the ones that thought this up, you know, it's definitely gonna attract an audience, but we had absolutely no idea of what, you know, what was was to come, you know? Yeah, I bet. It, well, it, the marketing of the picture was so groundbreaking uh, in so many ways. Oh, yeah. Daniel, did you guys uh, conceive that from the very beginning of production? Well, you know, we, we initially started, um, uh, you know, we cut together this little kind of eight minute trailer to kind of help raise money for the movie way early on and and then uh we we got to know john pearson you made it um that uh he, yeah. he took that eight minute trailer and kind of aired it on his show split screen that was on bravo That's and sundance channel and um and and he got a whole ton of response from that that yeah, trailer and that. and we were on his website and his bulletin board was just going crazy and from there all these people are asking, who are these Haxon guys, and what is there a website for this thing? And, and that's kind of when it dawned on us that we need to have like a website for people to come to. Yeah. And and our logic was like, well, I mean, Earthlink, you can get a website for free through Earthlink. You know, the forty dollar kind of monthly subscription to them, and you get kind of a free website. So Ed had some web web building experience from his previous job. So we just kind of threw a lot of the footage that we had shot up. Or, um, in Orlando, that was to be kind of this framing, kind of fake documentary stuff that was going to frame up this this, this documentary footage, and we put a lot of that stuff on the website. And, and one thing led to another, and we just started building this mythology on the website and adding to it as people kept asking questions. So it it grew very organically on the web, and we 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 found out you know pretty quickly that you know you have a compelling story like that, people really spread the word very well. Still on the web. Oh yeah. Um, well, I-, I wanted to ask you, you guys. W- you guys were hit with this enormous success, all three of you, so early in your careers. How does that? What? How does that help you, and how does it hinder you in a way? Uh, M- Michael, if you want to answer that first. Well, I'll be honest. I wasn't really ready for that kind of success. At that, I, I was younger than than pretty much everybody. You know, jo- well, Josh, Heather, and I were. We're a good uh, few years younger than these guys are. And, um, you know, not that I didn't enjoy it. I enjoyed it tremendously. Um, but uh, I just wasn't um, on an emotional level ready for the madness that sort of took over my life. Yeah. And uh, it took me it took me a couple few years to sort of back from it and see, and see uh, what about it that was good, to be honest. After, after like, the first year, I was basically sick and tired of it i just didn't know really what the big deal was i mean you know all of a sudden you're you're just a regular guy going about your life and all of a sudden you know you're at a party and people are laughing at your bad jokes and you know they're bad and you don't know why people are laughing and you realize then why they're laughing and it's not like i don't really want this so you sort of go through i sort of went through a struggle of what it was that i did want and uh i've been able to find that you know later on and um I'm very happy now, and I'm extremely proud to have been part of the project, and it certainly helped my career. 
um, in many ways. And not that it ever hurt my career, just emotionally it was sort of a weird phenomenon to happen to me at a young age. And it wasn't yeah. like I was 17 years old, but I just was not ready for it. You know, if that happens, you know, if that happened again, I'd, I'd have just a different perspective on it now. And I was yeah, more it does, ready it does for seem it, like you know? something that would be a real challenge to kind of come to grips with. It's uh, like like an overnight, uh, overnight kind of sensation, as they say. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was his overnight. It wasn't like I hadn't been a struggling actor then, but it was as overnight as overnight gets, I guess. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Uh, Daniel, what about you? How how has it how has it helped and possibly hindered uh, you? Do you think? Well, you know, as a filmmaker, you're, you know, I think of you know, we call ourselves artists, and I think we're always looking for respectability. And and it's weird. It's just like this double-edged sword with Blair. That you know, on there's one group of people out there that think. It's like the greatest thing since sliced bread, and it's like they, they kind of get the movie and so on and so forth. And then there's a whole other seemingly half of the audience that thinks it was a complete, you know, fluke and we got lucky and, and, and you know, we were a bunch of talentless schmucks that just were at the right place at the right time. And, you know, and I believe a little bit of that's true on both sides, you know. And, and you know, there was a lot to do with timing, and we, and we were very lucky. And, and uh, so... You know, as I move through my career and as I've grown and learned, you know, there's certainly a part of me that wants to, like, not only prove to myself, but, you know, also to the, the general public, like, we aren't just one-hit wonders and that, you know, we do have talent and we like to think that we can make normal movies and what have you. But so there is a little bit of that. You'll always be measured up against Blair Witch, and I certainly have no regrets, and it has opened a lot of doors for us. Um, but there's a part of me that kind of wishes it wasn't so big that we just t took the normal kind of climb, evolutionary climb up our careers to get to, you know, to the next one and then the next one. And, you know, everything is going to be measured against Blair Witch no matter what we do. And um, so, you know, with with the good, you take you take that bad. And and um, and I agree with with Mike that, you know, emotionally it was just a roller coaster. You know, all of a sudden people are like judging you on so many different levels and, and being your friend and, um, it, you know, you have to kind of sift through that insincerity and it's, it's you, you know, you have to walk around with this big filter, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's a challenge, definitely a challenge. And um, But, you know, I like to think of it, you know, at the end of the day that, you know, it's, you know, a lot of, a lot of, the complaints I have are good good problems to have. So, yeah. you know, Mr. Sanchez, was your experience similar? Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, it's you know, you're going through this thing that you know, really, no filmmakers have ever had ever gone through. I mean, nobody had ever had that kind of ridiculous success out of this, you know, thirty thousand dollar movie or whatever. Um, but you know, what Dan was saying is that you know, you're kind of like, um, you know, you're you're uh, you know, you're, 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 we just kind of like, Dan and I kind of just kind of sat back and tried to enjoy it as much as we could, you know? Mm -hmm. um, well, let's, let's talk about some of, uh, some of your work just briefly that, that you're doing now. I, I know that, uh, Mr. Sanchez, you just finished Altered, which is currently on DVD, and it's a great, great, enjoyable movie. And I, that was a good one. I like that one a lot. Yeah, Jerry and I both enjoyed it very much. And, uh, you're on pre production on a film called Seventh Moon. What, what can you tell, uh, what can you tell us about that film, Seventh Moon? Yeah, it, it's, uh, basically, uh, a, uh, uh, it takes place in, uh, in China, and it's these, basically these, uh, this honeymooning American couple are in China, and just some bad things start happening to them. Um, and like I said, we're, we're, we're casting right now, we're in pre production, we're heading there probably in about three weeks, and, uh, uh, kind of just moving forward from there. We hope to be done by Thanksgiving and uh, be back here and uh, you know start editing. But we're really excited. We're working with a lot of a lot of the same people that we work with on Altered, and uh, you know it, it's just it's just coming together. So I'm having a good time with that right now. Yeah, and Daniel, you've got uh, I know you have Believers, which is released in October. Is it October 14th on DVD or? October 16th. 16th? Yeah. And the Solstice, uh, th that was this year as well. Yeah, that was shot. I'm not sure when that's getting released yet, but that's that's uh, we shot that in, um, last year. And, and you're, uh, you're in post-production on a film called The Objective? Yes, that was one we, that uh, Mike was involved with that we shot in Morocco. Oh, wow. 
and uh, and I'm literally in the edit suite right now editing it. So we've been working on that for the last few weeks and hope to How's be it done. Coming, man? How's it it's coming? coming good, man. I'm, I've, I've got your mug on the screen right now. <laughs> uh, uh, Michael, and, and tell me about your tell me about your acting uh, studio. Uh, well, you know, I uh, I'm up in New York. I'm actually in Westchester, New York, and uh, I grew up here. And there, you know, to take a decent acting class, and not that there's not decent ones here but it's pretty limited you need to get on a train and get in the city um and uh, i just wanted to make it a little more accessible to people up here who might have an interest uh and i do uh kids and adults and i do scene study class improvisation class um and i found a, a nice uh audience up here who's uh just you know i'm thrilled to work with them they seem to be thrilled to work with me i really enjoy teaching just as much as i enjoy creating a character i love to watch a, a student come in who has you know no concept of what acting is and and basically you know transform over the course of you know six or eight weeks and watch them you know pick a scene and go through it for a number of weeks and really uh you know sort of get the whole thing that I believe acting is, which is, you know, being in the moment and oh, yeah. and uh telling the truth and creating a character. So it's just been a it's been a lot of fun. It's a small little outfit but uh you know it, it actually, you know, when I'm not working on films and stuff it it just keeps those creative juices flowing and I learn more from myself maybe teaching than I do actually working because you're constantly, you know, thinking about what is it that's working and not working with this scene with these people. So it's an interesting uh it's been an interesting development. Yeah. I, I have to Ask one more question before we close this up, and that's uh, the rumors of a Blair Witch prequel. Uh, any anyone want to tackle that one? Well, we, we'd like to do it. It's just a matter of you know whether or not Lionsgate wants to do it with us or not. So we're, we we definitely have some ideas, and uh, we we pitched them a concept of I don't know how long it's been now, but it's been quite a while. But uh, we we would like to do it. Um, but the only difference is this time it would be kind of a wacky kind of romantic comedy. <laughs> are are you serious kidding. or is that a joke? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that would definitely go against expectations. That would be uh, surprising. <laughs>